Welcome, welcome to episode six of Fireside Chats with Jed and Kina. Probably it would make more sense to people if we would mention in the title that this is about eschatology. Yes. <laughs> Not just us rambling about it's just whatever. Eschatological fireside chats. Eschatological fireside chats. And many people, when they begin to talk eschatology, are concerned about how close will we be to the fire. Yes. Yes. And it was cold when we started this, and we moved closer <laughs> we, to the we fire. We certainly did. It is chilly. <laughs> so, episode six, we are going to um, we're going to jump into the seals. Well, yes, but I'm going to do something before that. Okay, before because we, do we the have seals. had this multitude of questions, mostly in our minds, uh, <laughs> <laughs> about something we talked about last week, and so I want to look at this for just a moment. We, I, I, don't, I don't want to dwell on it because I don't, uh, I don't know enough about it to talk about it. But okay. we're going to talk about it anyway. Yes. Um, but that is the four and twenty elders. Uh, last week we we made mention of them in chapter five of Revelation. In our introductory remarks about the the four horsemen of the apocalypse, okay? Yes. Uh, and, uh, and the question came up, well, who are they? And we rambled around a little bit, but I want to clarify some things uh, before we go too far into this lesson. Um, first of all, let's go back and look and see what they said. Okay. Because you can, you can learn a whole lot about who somebody is by what they say. And in, in uh, chapter 5 of, uh, of Revelation, beginning, let's just jump in the middle of this in verse number 8. And when he had taken the book, talking about the Lamb, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, mm and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, mm -hmm. and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Mm. Now, at first glimpse, you, you immediately think of the church, the New mm -hmm. Testament church, because uh, several things there. Uh, thou hast redeemed us right, the redemption. to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto kings our God and kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. All of these are promises to and descriptions of the New Testament church. Uh, and in a previous lesson we talked about when the rapture might take place and, uh, and since we're just now fixing to get into the seals then uh, and the seals are obviously not open yet because they're just now praising the Lamb because He is worthy to break the seals right. and to open the book. Yeah. And so the question is: Is the New Testament church in heaven when the seals are not yet broken and the book has not yet been opened? Right. And if they're not, then who are these people? Well, that's the question. And so I know I just asked. Well, that, <laughs> it was a remarkable question, and uh, and it says that thou was slain. Obviously, it's talking about Jesus. Yes, it's talking about the uh, the crucified Messiah, and uh, he has redeemed us. It is someone that's been redeemed uh, by the Lord by thy blood, by the blood of the Lamb. And uh, there, that, that definition just fits nobody but the church, or uh, more specifically, we think in terms of the New Testament mm -hmm. church. 
Now, let me ask this question, and then hopefully I'll answer it. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> uh, what about what about the Old Testament saints? Okay, what about the Old Testament saints? We we always wonder this because uh, you know well, people I think have we this... kind of dismiss it, and we kind of like ignore. You know, we think about the patriarchs, but we just ignore the fact that there were millions of people that loved God and served God with a true heart yes. through the Old Testament, yes. uh, you know, times. Yeah. And but we tend to focus on Abraham and Moses and Daniel, you know. And a lot of people believe that when people die, that they are resting in their grave mm -hmm. until the rapture of the church. Right. And so here we see a, a, quite a few people that are obviously not resting in their grave. Right. And, uh, and they're, so we they're assume, in the well, presence mean, of God. Yes, has the rapture taken place? But now let's talk about these Old Testament saints. Now, we know for a fact that Enoch was just translated. He, God just was so impressed by him that when it, he never even died that he just literally, as far as the earth was concerned, he was not. Right. He was never buried, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, we just assume that he is, is with the Lord. And, and, and then another occasion that comes to my mind is Elijah, the prophet. He's scooped up by a right. fiery chariot and taken off. My father, my father. Yes, and something tells me that Enoch and Elijah are not the only two people in heaven. Mm. In fact, maybe there's 24 of them. <laughs> uh, but I want us to look for a moment in the book of Hebrews. Okay. Because the 11th chapter of Hebrews, which we call Faith's Hall of Fame, uh, is the most marvelous, marvelous chapter. And uh, it starts talking about uh, well, uh, what faith actually is, and then it begins to describe faith in the lives of great biblical characters. Okay. Okay. It it talks about uh, that by faith uh, Abel did this, and by faith Enoch uh, did this, and by faith Noah did this, and by faith Abraham did this, and it goes right on down through a list of some of the great, great characters that we find in the pages right. of the Old Testament church. Are you saying that you think there's 24 of them? Well, no, I'm not exactly saying that. Okay. But here's All what right. I am saying. Uh, that somehow these individuals who were people of faith, mm -hmm. that were people of such tremendous faith, that God saw that they made the record, they made the pages right. of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And they made the pages in such a way as to be an example for us. Right. And then, when he gets toward the, the end of that chapter, about verse 32, he says, And what more shall I say? Um, for the time would fail me to tell of, and he talked about Gideon and David and, and Samson and Jephthah and, and, and talks yeah. about a lot of other people that he just didn't have time to describe right. their tremendous walk by faith. Yeah, and the things that they went through because of their faith. Exactly, the persecution that they endured, the, the horrible atrocities that took place. Yeah, absolutely. I like what it says when it gets through a lot of those atrocities, and it says in verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. World was not worthy. It, that, 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 that is that, really isn't that, cool. Isn't that precious? Yes. Yes, it is. But what sums all of that up is the last verse of that chapter, and it says, God having provided some better thing for us. Right. Who's, who's he talking about? The church. He is talking about the New Testament church now. This is, well, we don't know who wrote this. We don't know. We don't know, but it could right. have been Paul. Could have could been. Could have been a number of people, but whoever wrote it was writing it about the New Testament church and to the New Testament church. God having provided some better thing for us that they, mm -hmm. talking about all of these people of faith right. in the Old Testament, 
without that, us without us should not be made perfect should not be made perfect so all of a sudden he's just brought the old testament church essentially the old testament saints yes and connected them to the new testament saints and said if it basically what he was saying was if jesus had not done what he did for us then it would have affected them mm -hmm. because it says God having provided some better thing for us, talking about right. the Holy Ghost experience, the salvation that we find in Jesus Christ, that they without us should not be made perfect or should not be made complete. Yeah. And think so there's a this. connection. There's yeah, a connection. there is. You think about how uh, the Day of Atonement was a rolling ahead yes. for one year. Yeah. And as a child, I remember thinking about that in the same way that you think of a snowball or, or like a tumbleweed that keeps gathering uh, whatever. The thing about Jesus was, is that those sins kept being rolled forward year after year after year. And those people all died, but yeah. their sins kept being rolled. He died for those sins just as surely as he died for the sins that I hadn't even committed yet. Exactly. He died for sins, past, present, and, and future. future. Wow. Yes. Yeah. And, what, and, and, and that, that perfect work that he did in us yeah. was also for them. Yes. Was also for them. So, now, are they all asleep in the grave? I would say not, because notice what chapter 12 says as it begins right. he's just talked about all of these people of faith and then he says wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses wow this this great cloud of witnesses sorry about all those kinds of people that he was discussing in the previous chapter yeah these amazing heroes of faith that dealt with persecution like we have never seen and do you know i think that every time we fight a battle in our spirit okay every time that we are in a struggle that i believe that this great cloud of witnesses mm -hmm are rooting for us Amen. to make the right decision right to make the right choice right to do the right thing yeah. because see notice what it says next is that after this this when we behold all this cloud of witnesses right. let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and run with, with patience, patience the, the race, race that, that is, is set, set before us. us you get the image of a coliseum in which olympic games are taking place yes and we're running and the place is full of spectators. And they're screaming right. for all they can do there. You can do this. Yes. Like, press on. You can get there. It's like a horse race, and they've put their money on us. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. But yeah. it is encouraging to think, because um, we do sometimes get this idea that there's unseen things that are judging us. You know? And, yeah. and we attribute that to God. We're like, you know... You know, he's watching me fail or whatever. When in fact, God doesn't want us to fail. He's doing everything he can to, to put us in a place where we can succeed. Yeah. He's paid all the debts for us. Yes. And then this, this entire crowd of Old Testament saints are saying, yes, you can do it. You can do it. You can you do can. it. Absolutely. 70 Absolutely. years is nothing. Yeah. I did 967. <laughs> I did 967 flat. Oh, Methuselah, shut up. <laughs> Imagine the candles on that birthday cake. <laughs> yeah, yes, really. Uh, but that, that's cool. So we're, think, we're thinking that the, the 4 and 20 elders is, is this, these heroes of faith or, the, or representative of yeah. all these folks that came through the Old Testament and persevered pursuing God to the degree that they were able to. And I would have to say that since we know approximately when John wrote the book of Revelation, somewhere around 96 AD or something like that, mm -hmm. that the church, the New Testament church had actually been in existence by that time for almost 70 years. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that, 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 that those Old Testament saints were Hebrews mm -hmm. almost exclusively. Well, 
We don't really know well, that. Well, we don't really know that. But I you mean, know. you've got people like Rahab. You've got people like uh, Ruth. Well, exactly. You got, and, exactly. and here's the thing. is like, hey, And you've got that one, Abraham. <laughs> right? I mean, he was an Ur, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 and and all of those before him, they were not right. Hebrews, but yeah, and, but but that's why that's why these these that that uh, these are singing a song that they were says that they were out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, mm -hmm. and uh, it's interesting. So uh, it is interesting. Uh, now, why twenty four elders? I don't know. It could be that it's representative of the twelve tribes of Israel and the twelve apostles. Who knows? It could be some other. You know, I don't understand all of God's numerology. Right. Yes. You know, and these four beasts. I also uh, don't know why he threw them in there at that particular time. So now you don't want to talk about these four beasts. Well. Let's not talk about this. <laughs> not right now. Okay. So, yes. so we're thinking the four and twenty elders, and so we come out of chapter five, where in chapter five, which we talked about extensively last time, um, in episode five, when we were talking about the horsemen, um, them talking about the lamb that was worthy to to break the seals or to open the book, yeah. And you come into yeah. chapter six with the first of the seals, and that's where you have the four horsemen. We talked about the four horsemen last week, and uh, and basically, you know, we made mention that they they weren't four horsemen galloping over the hill or coming down, uh, you know, into the valley uh, right. together. And 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 uh, so let me let me talk just a little bit about the timetable here, because we're going to in the next few weeks we're going to be talking about the seals. Yeah. We're going to be talking about the trumpets. Right. We're going to be talking about the vials. And we might make mention of the thunders. Okay. Okay. And uh, not a lot's known about the thunders. No, no, it's not. It's not. It, that's why we may not talk about it very much. Okay. Because anything we say over one statement is going to be, we we'll have to make it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about the seals. Yeah. And the first okay. seal is yes the four now, horsemen. Something that that, that that people need to understand, though, in the scripture, we we. The, we, we have, I don't know if we've addressed the question of the chronology we have. of... We've talked that. about how some things are parenthetical and are inside okay. other okay. things. And so we have t timelines. We have a timeline for the seals, a timeline for the trumpets, a timeline for the vials, and then we, we find a conjunction point between them and can work backwards from there to help us to understand how they relate to each other. Right. Okay. So we're talking about the seals now. Okay. The seals. Now, a uh, couple of thoughts uh, on, on, on time table of the seals. Some people think that, that, the, that the seven seals are going to all take place uh, in Daniel's 70th week and that none of them have happened yet. Okay. Other people think, well, they've covered a, a, a modest period of time historically and that we may already be past a couple of them okay uh, and then there is the view that I personally uh, claim uh, is that the that the, the time of the seals covers most of biblical history up until the present day okay okay and, uh, and, and you'll understand that a little bit better when, you, when I identify what I feel like is a, a logical explanation of these seals. Now, let me point out to you that scriptural prophecy as a general rule can never be fully understood until it's, after over. it's fulfilled. Yes. Oh, absolutely. You know, and you see that specifically with the messianic prophecies. Like, they're crystal clear after you see Jesus and you know yes. everything that happened in his life. Yeah. But up until that point, it's kind of a big mystery. That, and that's why the Jews had such a hard time right. accepting him because he was the kid from Nazareth. Right. Right. You know? But and, after uh, you see all of these things, like, coming to be... And I think that's why a lot of the scribes and Pharisees actually started going, 
wait a second, because yes. they started seeing some things happening. They but, started finding out that he was fulfilling right. biblical prophecy. Because they knew the prophecy. They knew the prophecy. So, but with, with end time events, we're in kind of in the similar spot as, you know, everyone else was, as yeah. far as Jesus. And that is, well, we don't know exactly, because everything isn't done yet. Exactly, exactly. So, um, and, and, let me, and let me give you a typical example of that is Israel coming into existence as a modern day nation in 1948. Right. Prior to that, people who were God loving and God fearing people who knew the scripture, they had a hard time understanding biblical prophecy that related to Israel because she, because didn't, she exist. didn't exist. Yes. And they could not even imagine right. that she would exist again. Right. And they tried to connect it to her prior existence. Right. Yes. And I'm sure some people now still struggle because when you're looking at Daniel's 70th week and you're seeing temple worship, but there's no temple. And exactly. again, they refer back to, well, that was talking about yes. back at uh -huh. the last temple. Yeah. And, it, and, and so, that's why they thought Nero was the Antichrist. Right. Yes. I mean, he would have made... I mean, he was a booger, for hey, sure. And he played while Rome burned. Nasty, nasty well, anyway, man. Anyway. That's another story. So. For another episode. Seals. Yes, the seals. Okay. Well, let's look at the seals, and let's see if we can't identify them and and understand that that we don't know a whole lot more than y'all do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but... Maybe a little. Okay. Uh, or at least about this. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And that is coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, well, look at here. White horse rider. Mm -hmm. You know, the white horse rider is always the good guy. I and sometimes he wears a white hat. Right. It doesn't seem like that to me. Doesn't he doesn't cut yeah, exactly, but he looks like he may be trying to imitate he might be a good guy. Imitate maybe. a good guy. Yeah. Yeah, but he's got the white horse. Uh, and he has a bow. Now, let me let me explain something here. Yeah. Uh, I, I realize that when we read this in this context, we immediately think of a bow and arrow. Yeah. Okay. We think of him on a horse with a bow and he's going to fight with the bow. It doesn't mention any arrows. Right, it doesn't. Uh, if it we're just gonna be literal, says yeah. a, a bow. Yeah. Okay. Now, let me... You're not about to say I am he's wearing a bow. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Are you about to suggest that the first seal is a very, very effeminate horseman? <laughs> Well, it's not a pink bow. <laughs> no, I want us to think about the only other time that comes to my mind when a bow is mentioned in the oh, scripture. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's just suppose we knew where it was in the scripture and we turn back to Genesis. Are you talking about like when God said, My bow in the sky? Joe. Uh, Joe. <laughs> 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 Not Joe. Uh, Genesis chapter 9. Okay. Okay. Now, this is the story of Noah. Okay. It's fairly familiar to most Christians. God has destroyed the world by flood. He has saved Noah and his family uh, on the ark that they uh, invested a uh, hundred years to build. And notice in, in, in chapter 9 of Genesis, verse number 13, uh, in fact, let me back up to verse 12, and God said, 
This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Wow. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh, and the bow shall be in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, well, we could read more, but that's all I need right now. Uh, the, the bow shall be in the cloud. Now, basically, we understand that what we call a rainbow is what God used to make a covenant with mankind that he would never destroy the earth by flood again. Mm -hmm. and, and, and basically what it was, it sealed that covenant. Okay. It represented that covenant. Right. Okay. Now, back to Revelation, we see this white horse rider and <clears throat> he has a bow. Right. Now, and he's sent forth conquering, which seems like the opposite of what God was trying to well, say here. Well, and there it is, you see. He has a bow, but the bow is not in the cloud. Right. The bow is probably in his hand. Right. Okay? He has the bow. Yeah. And so, let's just say the bow represented a covenant. Okay. All right. But the covenant would not be with God. It would be with the white horse rider. Now, does, is that making any, any yeah, sense that's, to that's you? Yeah, that's making sense. I'm just very interested in where we're going. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I kept looking at this so and I thought, well. Oh, as a covenant. Yes, yes. And then it says, a crown was given unto him, mm -hmm. unto the white horse rider. Right. Okay. And it says, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Okay. Now, let me take a stab at identifying this white horse rider. And, and, I, and I, all I can really call him is the apostate church. Mm. The apostate right. church. Now, if we think about the genuine church of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay. the church that the he was talking Acts, about. You're going all the way back yes. to the beginning of and, the church. And, and he had told his disciples, on this rock I will build my church. And that rock was the identity of who he who was. He was right? the, the revelation of who he was. Of Jesus Christ. Yes. Being and, the Messiah, yes. the Christ. And then we, in, 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 the, in the book of Acts early on, we see the birth of the New Testament church. Right. And we see it identified by the Apostle Peter, newly filled with the Holy Ghost. Right. And they asked him the question, what right. shall what we do? What do we do? Yeah. And he said, repent. Right. Be baptized in right. the name of the Lord Jesus Christ right. for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the right. gift of the Holy Ghost. You will receive it. It's coming. Yeah. And then a few verses later, it talks about how that the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, what was the apostles' doctrine? It was exactly what Peter said, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and filling of the Holy Ghost. Right. That's what we understand today. That's what, right. that's what the Word of God requires of us. It requires us to repent of our sins. It requires baptized. us to be washed in baptism right. in the name of the Lord. And, he promises and to be to filled fill with His Spirit. Yes. And it, it's just that simple. It's not, it's not a hard thing. Right. It's not a complicated thing. Right. However, I believe just as soon as the church was born into existence in yeah. Acts chapter 2, a spirit of Antichrist began to work. Oh, you know it did. And to begin to try to confuse people 
and to be in fact it was already the 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 some of the early meetings of the of the apostles they would get in arguments over wonder what are we going to require of the gentiles right. are we going to require circumcision yeah. or not yeah and you and see repeatedly in paul's letters yeah like be aware that this is not right yes and look he had a lot of things to address especially and said, like to yes. the corinthians and stuff but like there were some times where he specifically said this is the spirit of antichrist the spirit of antichrist the spirit of antichrist doth already work mm -hmm. he said absolutely so what happened was in those first centuries and by centuries i mean groups of hundred years <laughs> A century the first is a hundred years. Yes, the first two or three hundred years right. of the yeah. existence of the church. You start seeing these. We begin to see formal religion. Mm -hmm. Formal religion. Well, and if you study, you see that because at that time the Roman Empire was vast. Yes. And every time they would conquer a nation, they had a tendency to accumulate what they wanted from their culture yeah. and kick out the rest. Yeah. Now, the positive thing was that the Romans were amazing and their widespread um, influence also injected some real um, positive things into some cultures that were very rural. Oh, yeah. But it was weird how in order to meld together people from all these different, let's just call them tongues and tribes and <laughs> nations that they would take a little bit from here and take a little bit from there and all of a sudden you have the church that is taking in these pagan type ritualistic type things yes and you know there's a lot of folks that you know we just came through christmas and um and you know new years and all of these things and a lot of folks are like well we shouldn't celebrate christmas uh, we shouldn't celebrate the birth of christ because that's essentially the reason it's there is because of the winter um, solstice, solstice yes. and you know that's just and and the tree thing is just a pagan thing and i understand that there is a lot of stuff that christianity started drawing from other cultures yeah and started pulling in but there's two different ways to look at these things and there's two different ways to treat them also. There are some things, like it, does, like it doesn't matter if I have a Christmas tree or not. And I, and I celebrate Jesus all the time, you know? Yes. So those things are not really that important. Time. I mean, in my yard, I'm not like a tree killer <laughs> like my mom. <laughs> yeah. But those things are not super important. Like, they're not sacred to me. Right, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, just a, it's just a decoration. Yeah, yeah. But there were things that the early church started drawing in that became part of their religious practice. Yes. And it actually, instead of moving people closer to God, it started putting more barriers between them and God. And the thing is, Dad, is when you're turning a ship, you can just turn it a little bit, but once you get on down a few thousand leagues, you're a long way away from where you were supposed to be. Exactly, exactly. And you know, and it was just some of the things were just simple little things like, uh, for instance, uh, the Bible says, call no man father. Yet that, that thing became part of, got in, instilled in the church so that a religious leader was father. Right. Okay. They did the same thing with Reverend. Which yes, yes. Pastor Mills used to always. I only mentioned, I think, five times in the scripture that word reverend, yet it never pertained to anyone but God, yet everyone's a reverend. We have right. a reverend running for senator. Right. You know? But it's reverend. interesting because yes. Brother Mills used to reverend. always say, yes. like, don't call me reverend, because in the word of God, it yeah. only refers to God. Exactly. Exactly. So there are things like that that have been incorporated. Yes. Uh, another one, uh, you know, thou shalt have no graven image. Right. Yet it became very commonplace. It was kind of like they changed it to say, "Thou shalt have no graven image unless it's of an important person in in right you know, in Christendom." In, in Christendom, right. yes, yes. You know, so and, and, and so, but 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 what happened is that that an apostate church began to grow and to gain strength and to gain power, 
and at its peak of power, which was for another several hundred years, the leader of that church had total authority over every king, wow. every emperor, right. every monarch. You could not be crowned king of England without the, without the, the Pope's of the permission. Church. You could not marry if you were if you were the, the if you were the king of Spain and you wanted to marry the daughter of the uh, of the king of France. You had to ask the head of the church permission, right? Because he had more power and authority than right. the kings of individual and countries. And it got worse because then, because the kings recognized the amount of power that the church had, political power. Yes. Then they decided, um, I don't want you to be in control of my life. I'm going to start my own church. Yes. Yes. King Henry VIII did that. Yeah, I'm very tired thing. of you bossing me around. I'm going to start my own church. Yes. And, then, and so you see, like, this blossoming of uh -huh. the, this apostasy in which, like, anyone with any sense would be like, you can't just start a church based on you want to be divorced. That's not <laughs> that's not a tenet of faith, right, right? Right. But that's exactly what happened. Yeah. And it's still in existence today. Exactly. Now, exactly. And this is one of the things that I think is really important about uh, people that are truly trying to follow the Book of Acts and that early church yeah. mentality is you are not a Protestant if you are basing your uh, relationship with God and your body of Christ experience on the book of Acts. Yeah. You're not a Protestant. Anything that is called Protestant is in reference to those who protested the Catholic Church and came out of it. Those who yes. protested whatever church and came out of it. Yeah. The book of Acts is about before denomination. It was the church. It was pre-denominational. Yes. It was the, it was the Church of the Apostles. It was totally apostolic, right? And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking and the in bread. Breaking actually, the bread, that's the bread would be good, wouldn't it? And in prayers, and in fellowship, <laughs> or fellowship and prayers. You Please. seem really concerned about. Well, that. anyway, yeah. Like, I, but now, but here's something I think we need to understand. I know they were praying, but were they fellowship? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's something we need to understand, though. Yeah. Is that the ch the church, and I mean by the church, the apostate church, became so powerful in people's lives that they instilled in the people that you can't be saved without the church's consent. Right. You can't, right. in fact, you can't even take communion if, right. if you're not given permission to. Right. And, 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 and if you can't take communion, you're lost and, and you're dying puts, and going to a devil's hell. all of the onus on the church has control of your salvation, which when exactly. you think about it, Dad, yes. is exactly what essentially was uh, happening with the apostate uh, temple worship. Yes. yes, When Jesus came along, that's exactly where they were. Yeah. They were like, hey, you can't have your sins forgiven unless you have two pigeons and a turtle dove, and I happen <laughs> to have some right here. Yeah, but it's going to cost you. $20. <laughs> right? It's the yeah, same kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, it's it the is. the same kind of thing. It is. But, but here's the thing is if this is indeed the white horse rider, basically the ultimate goal of the white horse rider was to substitute the worship of God to the worship of the church. Mm. That right. the church became the source of salvation. Right. The source. You see? Yes, and that's the thing, is that we know that we are saved through faith right. by the grace of God right. and that our, our, our salvation is only from Jesus right. Christ. But we have to be careful that we don't 
direct people to believe that the church is the source of their salvation. Right. The church is the, church, the body of Christ. Right. The church is what edifies. Yes. The church is what builds you up it into that most you. holy faith. Yes. It yes. is that. It picks you up when right. you fall. Yes. Yes. That's really good. It is good. And it helps you it helps you fall less often. I mean, how yes. often, how many yes. times do you have someone that encourages you and 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 gives you a word and then that week Something happens, and that word comes to mind, and it's like, wow, this is crazy. You know, yeah, someone spoke yeah, into my yeah. life, and this, so, yes, so, so the first, this first seal, this white horse rider is, um, the apostate church, the apostate church, man. Yeah. And, and it's everywhere. Yes. I, you see it, what's disturbing to me is that you even see it in spirit-filled churches, that apostasy that directs people to something else or someone else sometimes yes. as their savior. It, it frustrates me. I love that people you know, have access to a lot of word, but it frustrates me when they spend their time with the Lord, they spend watching someone who's essentially giving a great self-help speech in a pulpit. <laughs> on a TV yeah. screen. And that, that frustrates me because it's like all of us could get up and make you feel better about where you are right now. Yeah. But what God wants is for us to look at where we are now in comparison to where we were yesterday and see if that's any better. Yeah. Yeah. You know? We and need to keep not, moving towards God. See, yes, yes. You know? Don't make yes. me feel better about my mud hole. Tell me how to get out of it. Yeah. Exactly. So that's great. So seal number one is the white horse rider at the apostate church. So tell you what, I think at this point, we probably, we could go ahead and close out this session. And then um, in our next episode, we can move on into the next seal, which I believe is another horseman. I believe you're right. All right. But it has been delightful to talk about this tonight. I, and and uh, the, um, the raspberry chocolate coffee has been fantastic. Wasn't that also. good? And the cup yeah. matches my shirt. And makes your eyes sparkle. Oh! <laughs> I Thank love you. it when my eyes sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this episode, and we will see you next week when we will be in episode number seven.